You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Welcome to the Non-Traditional Pharmacist Podcast, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. The Non-Traditional Pharmacist provides the pharmacist professional ideas to help you think outside the box. Pharmacy is evolving fast. And this podcast is all about the evolution of the pharmacist role in healthcare. And now, here is the non traditional pharmacist team Lynn, Matt, and Nick. Matt Paterini here with the non traditional pharmacist, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. We've been talking a lot about technology as a emerging area for pharmacists, and rightfully so. There's a lot of uh, opportunity in the technology space. Um, but another area of pharmacy uh, that it gets a lot of attention, and we're gonna highlight some of some of those key areas today, um, is around regulatory affairs. Um, also a very fast growing uh, area of pharmacy. And one of the reasons is the large number of different careers available in the regulatory space. Um, saw a statistic uh, recently from the US uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics that the regulatory market will actually grow at an average rate of 8% until uh, 2026. So um, exciting area to be in, and and we're lucky to be joined by uh, Brendan Doran today, uh, Assistant Director of Operations, Regulatory Affairs and Medical Writing at CTI Clinical Trial and Consulting Services. So we're going to learn about uh, his work there and the regulatory space in general. So Brendan, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Thanks for having me, Matt. Pleasure to have you on. Uh, we like to start with the same question for all of our guests, and that is, um, what was your path through pharmacy like? Kind of give us a, a start to finish, and I know it's an ongoing story, but where you started, how you got into pharmacy, and your path to this point. Sure, yeah. You know, it, it, it's certainly uh, very non-traditional. Um, when I had graduated from, from undergraduate, I went to Mercyhurst College in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, for me, it was always going to be pharmacy or dentistry, and, and really before I made the uh, six-figure investment in uh, tuition, I really wanted to make sure I was making the right choice. So instead of going right out of undergrad and uh, into, into school, um, I took some time and, and uh, worked as a pharmacy technician, shadowed dentists and oral surgeons and, and a, f- you know, a few others, and, and along the way, just to stay on top of academics, I had started taking a research certificate program at the University of Cincinnati. And through that, uh, I was exposed to a number of different research companies in the Cincinnati area, one of them being CTI, who, who I work for now. Um, and, and there was a number of guest speakers. So just learning about what a CRO is, a contract research organization, and, and what they do, and then just hearing the type of work they do, I said, wow, you know, that sounds incredibly interesting. Uh, so I started working there as I was continuing to, to try to pick my path of, of which way to go. And along the way, um, at CTI and, and throughout, I had a chance to work with PharmDs uh, and, and, and pharmacists who um, may have worked in regulatory affairs or in clinical trial operations or pharmacists at, uh, at academic centers that, were, that are investigational research pharmacists. So um, along with the traditional uh, hospital retail type settings, I mean, to me, what really sold me and, and, and got me going to pharmacy was just the portability of the, of the degree. So for me, it was a no brainer. Uh, so actually, it was about 10 years ago, uh, last week, I believe, uh, is, is when I left and had, uh, had, had started school. So if I had to do it all over again, I'd do the same thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, Myself, personally, I actually consider dental school as well. Um, but the word you mentioned, portability, um, resonated with me because, yes, there are a lot of different avenues. And that's part of what we're trying to do with the non-traditional pharmacist is highlight some of those uh, new paths and some of those unique paths um, that pharmacists can learn from and uh, potentially embark on similar journeys. Um, so, so CTI and regulatory affairs, just at a high level, what is regulatory affairs? Yeah, so, so regulatory affairs, and, and that's a fantastic question because you, you can look at it from a number of different uh, ways, but I think from, from our perspective, uh, our regulatory affairs group, we take 
clients and, and it might be small biotech, which you might call two guys in a molecule, uh, up to large, large pharma companies. We help them get really from the concept phase uh, of a trial, you know, where they may be ready to, to start some investigation, new drug application or IND, uh, helping them get to the point where they submit to FDA or the European Medicines Agency or other regulatory bodies. And in a way, uh, we help them develop strategies to start thinking about uh, really go for approval for your, your new drug application, your biologic license application or other marketing applications. Uh, what sort of uh, messaging do you want to have when uh, on that label and, and, and how to develop along the way? So, um, you know, it, it's, it's very neat seeing projects that we work on that we may start at the very beginning with, with small type, you know, consulting type projects where we might help them strategize on uh, endpoints for a clinical trial. And then you see that, you know, our group, you know, with what's another neat part is being able to take that, help them submit their IND, pass that off to our clinical trial operations team, run the trials, and then a few years later come back and we help them to develop that, those marketing applications. So, so there's, there's a lot of different areas where you, you can get in the regulatory affairs on the, the, the pre-market and, and post-marketing side. A lot of different opportunity, it sounds like, and you know, boy, you could spend a lot of time learning about all the different avenues just within regulatory sure. affairs. I mean, you mentioned that you're doing some work now around contract research organizations. Could you expand a little bit more on what CROs are? Sure, yeah. So, so a CRO or contract research organization, it, which is what CTI is, and there, there's many others out there. Uh, so really, they're another set of hands for a biotech company, a pharmaceutical company, or a device company. So um, if you look at, at our company, we have many arms. So we have a regulatory affairs group. We have our clinical trial, trial operations group, which includes um, project management. So the, the ones that run the studies, we have a data team, a stats team. We have uh, a, a medical affairs team, vigilance or safety teams. And on sort of the, the other end, when you're starting to think about the approval, we have a, a health out outcomes and economics research group, or, or sometimes called real world evidence. Um, so so there's, there's many different areas where clients may come to a CRO for. Um, and, and, you know, again, you know, if it's a smaller company, they, they use us as, as almost, you know, that extra sort of FTE or, or many FTEs. Or if they are larger, larger pharma companies, they may come to us for the global reach to, if they want to run trials in U.S. and Canada and EU and Japan, uh, just to have that, that reach instead of having to hire full-time employees in those locations. Okay, so what about your role specifically within CTI? Uh, maybe give some background on day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities, but also you know, what, you're, what you're doing in the large organization. Sure. Yeah. So I've, I've been in this role for about a year. Uh, prior to that, I, I split time, sort of a hybrid role. So I oversaw, uh, we have an, uh, a research unit. So I oversaw our investigational uh, drug pharmacy uh, for phase one through four studies. And then also did some clinical trial study management. Um, and, and, you know, so a lot of, lot of good experience there. And we can certainly talk about opportunities where, where PharmDs may, may be involved there. Um, my current role as assistant director of operations. Um, so I oversee a group of uh, so regulatory scientists, uh, I guess you'd call. So anywhere from, we have, we have a, another PharmD on our team. Uh, we also have PhD level folks, master's levels. Uh, so, so typically scientists in, in our group, they do a mix between um, regulatory affairs and medical writing. There are some companies may have uh, you know, sort of separate groups where the Regulatory group does a regulatory and we pass it off to the medical writing. But the way we look at it is you know, as you're developing a lot of these regulatory documents, you, you need to be able to write to them. So from an efficiency standpoint, uh, for us, it just makes sense. So I um, oversee, oversee the team that's you know, doing these projects. So on any given day, um, you know, we, we have, I think, somewhere around 60 to 70 active projects that are in certain stages of activity. So it's a lot of juggling and then uh, trying to resource because some may be uh, unlike a clinical trial that may last a couple of years. Some of these projects we work on might last for two weeks to a month or, or some may be a little longer term, six months to a year. Uh, so so the, that's the one neat thing about it is it's, it's, it's every day I'm always curious to see, you know, what comes in. 
And I also have the opportunity to sit in a lot with our, uh, our, our sales team and get on a lot of calls to try to bring business in to talk about our regulatory affairs capabilities with companies uh, across the globe. And the other night we were just on a call with an Australian company who's looking to come into the U.S. So it's neat just, just being able to be exposed to folks from all over the globe. Well, that's phenomenal. 60 active projects at one time. We can talk about project management skills coming into play a sure. little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, uh, look, luckily we also have uh, some project managers in the group. So, so they, they, they're assigned to sort of keep, uh, keep everybody going kind of the sheep herders, I guess you could say to keep the budgets in check and everybody on time and uh, you know, keep the, keep it, uh, keep the clients happy. Yeah. Yeah. You'd almost have to. Um, we talk about technology uh, as an emerging area in pharmacy a lot. How has technology impacted your role or your business um, to an extent, or how do you see it impacting it in the future? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, this is another exciting area. I, th I think we could talk for an hour or so about this. So um, from the, the pharmacy standpoint, and I'm sure if anybody listening to this, that's ever done investigational pharmacy um, have, have I've probably used an IWRS or sometimes called it an IVRS, so interactive web response system for randomizations. Um, on my in my old role, I had a chance to work with our information technology group on uh, sort of being the business owner of of those systems and helping to develop the the randomization process, the drug shipment process. So seeing the 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 technology and even the user interfaces on these these systems uh, continually. Uh, improve. I think in my career, I've used, um, gosh, I'd say at least 50. Um, and, and over the years, I think they've, they've gotten a lot better. I mean, it, it'd be great to see. Um, I think I've heard rumors that, that there's sort of a phone, uh, phone based uh, app that's coming along that would make life a lot easier, especially for uh, late night or urgent randomizations when it's not exactly easy to get to a, to a computer. So, so that's one area. And then the other area, I think just in general, the technology and maybe it's the science and the technology. I think we're seeing, you know, our company particularly works in a lot of immunology uh, and a lot of cell and gene therapy. So just seeing the advances in science and, and the technology, whether it's in the delivery systems, um, you know, the, the way these, uh, the, the, these products are manufactured or made, um, you know, to me, that's one of the most exciting thing about working in, in, in the, you know, the CRO world. So you're, you're not, um, you don't have one or two or, or five products in, in your portfolio that, that you know and, and uh, you work with every day. I mean, you know, every day when you come into work, we're, even our medical directors, I mean, we have some pretty world-renowned medical directors, um, and they're, they're excited just by some of the science that, and, and technology that we get to see along the way. Yeah, that keeps it interesting. Um, it's, it's always nice to, you know, see new stuff, learn new things. You're never bored. Hey, Pharmacy Podcast Nation, here's a quick message from our sponsors, supporting the PPN, QD. If you or your patients struggle with muscle cramps, spasms, soreness, or restless leg syndrome, you're going to want to hear about our non-opioid TheraWorks Relief. TheraWorks Relief is a clinically proven and published locally acting topical solution that prevents and relieves muscle cramps, spasms, and soreness in the legs and feet. In a research study including patients diagnosed with restless leg syndrome, TheraWorks Relief was shown to reduce symptoms commonly associated with accompanying RLS, including muscle cramps and spasms. Muscle cramps are reported as a side effect of hundreds of prescription medications, from intravenous iron sucrose and conjugated estrogens to statins and diuretics. By managing muscle cramps, TheraWorks Relief supports adherence, helping patients stay on important and often life-saving medications. TheraWorks Relief comes in an easy-to-use, fast-absorbing, non-greasy foam that can prevent muscle cramps and spasms with just a few simple applications a day. To learn more about TheraWorks Relief, go to theraworksrelief.com and click on the healthcare professional link. Where's the regulatory space today? I think it's, it's, it's an exciting time to be in regulatory. Um, you know, for those that might have been paying attention to Scott Gottlieb and what he's doing at FDA, I mean, I think he's really trying to pull out a lot of stops to help try to get, you know, some of those critical access uh, products, you know, to, to market or, or, or those that might be on shortage to try to get them uh, back on market. So um, a couple of different areas we see that in. Um, recently, you know, uh, Scott Gottlieb just had a, uh, I believe it was an op-ed in the New England Journal, 
um, about, you know, right now for gene therapy, there's a couple of different steps each company needs to go through. Uh, that's through FDA, but there's also the NIH recombinant uh, DNA advisory committee. So they're looking at trying to streamline that process and maybe make it, you know, a couple, little less duplication um, and make it, make it easier on everybody. Uh, the other area that I think we've all as pharmacists been watching for quite a while and I think FDA is really trying is in the biosimilar space and, and just sort of waiting to see what's, what's going to happen with those and, and, and market share. Uh, so it sounds like FDA is really pushing to try to get those going. Uh, so I think it's, it, it is an exciting time to be in, in regulatory. Is your team in particular hiring or looking for uh, pharmacists? Uh, we, we are hiring right now, actually, yes. Yeah. So we have a director level position open right now. Um, so the typical candidate that, that we would have, a good example is uh, somebody on our team who is, he's, he's a pretty senior level person. So he, he's a PharmD by training. Um, so, and, and it's funny, the pharmacists you meet in regulatory affairs or even medical writing, a lot of times it's, you know, they kind of, you know, fall into it accidentally. So he had, um, uh, he has, probably has about 20 years of experience, and, and he started out in a, um, a hospital setting, moved into a pharmacology clinic, uh, doing some research, and then went into industry, and he's been in industry ever since. Um, so he's gained a lot of experience on, say, the trial side, um, you know, even the post-marketing sort of medical science liaison side, and then now he's on the regulatory side. So, um, you know, certainly opportunities for pharmacists out there. I think, you know, the, the role we're, we're looking for right now is somebody that, that does have experience. But, um, you know, one thing that, you know, since I, I've been back uh, with CTI for about four years and uh, the, the pace that we're growing right now is, is really encouraging. And I would imagine within the next six months to a year or somewhere around there, we'll probably be looking for, for additional uh, staff. That's fantastic. What advice would you give to people who are interested in pursuing a path, either with CTI or not even necessarily CTI in particular, but regulatory affairs? Yeah. So I think, you know, just like, you know, with, with almost any industry or role, I mean, it, it is what you know, but it's also who you know. Um, so along the way, the relationships that, that you've, you've built, I mean, I think networking is, is one of the biggest things, um, especially in, in the CRO space. I'm, I'm always amazed by um, you know, as we get on a lot of these calls with many clients, um, with smaller biotech, smaller pharma companies, as some uh, are acquired or, or dissolve, you know, how, how many people sort of bounce around. And as we stay in contact, we understand, you know, where they are and every, every so often they end up working for us. Uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's one aspect. And the other piece is, you know, it's, it, it, it is difficult, I think, without having um, any research experience to really get in there. So I think there's plenty of certificate programs out there online or through many universities that are offered in, in research. And there's also masters, um, just maybe depends on how much you uh, want to spend on that. But um, I think, you know, if, if you're around a university area that has a research, at least certificate program, uh, I think doing it in person um, it is good because of the guest lecturers that you may meet along the way and the connections you can make, you know, and, and then the other option would be, you know, the, the various online certificate programs that they have. Yeah, we talk about that so often with the non-traditional farmers and part of the reason we are trying to facilitate a platform of networking is because it's so important. Um, we know to get new positions, new careers, new change of career path, whatever it may be, um, that the contacts and relationships that you build are so yeah. important to do that. Absolutely. Where think, do you, uh, many of the jobs I've gotten are, are, are uh, you know, uh, from the contacts that I've, that I've made along the way. So I'd, uh, I, I see that as one of the, one of the biggest things I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. The, you know, we even talk about go as far as to say you can't obtain a job with a, job application or submitting a resume. You have to build a relationship or make some key and critical contacts in that organization if you truly want to have a position there. Thanks for listening to The Non-Traditional Pharmacist. Be sure to share this podcast with your work associates, your professional network, and remember, always be thinking outside the pillbox.